Okay, well, good morning, everyone. I'm Courtney. This is Jay, Jay and Anikit. And today we'll be talking about the numerical analysis of pulse tile flow in aneurysms. First, just to start out with a little bit of background. What causes an aneurysm and what is it exactly? So the structural integrity of an arterial wall is lost due to the cyclic fatigue that it undergoes due to the pumping heart, and it's constantly reshaping and remodeling, so this can cause some areas that are weaker within an artery or within a vein, just based on um, someone's specific anatomy or if they have a certain condition. And in these weaker regions, um, a saccular or a fusiform aneurysm can grow. We'll be focusing on a saccular aneurysm for this study, but um, a fusiform aneurysm is mostly defined by an abnormal diameter. There are severe consequences to this, which can be rupture, has a high mortality rate, especially within 30 days after a rupture due to complications, um, or hemorrhage, which is just another word for internal or external bleeding. Blood can be defined by its different properties. Uh, we talked briefly in class about Wimmersley flow, which is pulse tile flow. Um, as the heart beats, it's driven by a pressure gradient along the longitudinal direction of a vessel, whether this is down through the arteries or back up through the veins. The frequency of these pulses can change. We'll be focusing on tachycardia, which is an increased heart rate, which can be caused either from a heart condition or simply from exercise or giving presentations like these. <laughs> um, it also behaves as a non-Newtonian fluid, as we've also briefly discussed. So its viscosity decreases with shear stress, um, also known as shear thinning, and we will refer to it as uh, thixotropy a little bit later. It's composed of plasma, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. And in the figure on the right, you can see this is what it would look like separated by a centrifuge. But these red blood cells kind of behave a little abnormally. Um, they form these rouleaus based on stacking, and so this, these structures can kind of cause different viscosity, and it usually changes with the blood flow, and this can actually be taken account by CFD, by using a um, scalar structural parameter. In case you're unfamiliar with CFD, um, it's short for computational fluid dynamics, and it's basically just an analysis of the fluid flow using numerical solutions. First, you would establish your geometry and the fluid domain, which is the space in which your fluid will be flowing. Um, also, you establish your um, properties and your boundary and initial conditions, which can then be placed into your navier stokes equations that will be numerically solved. You also generate your mesh for your geometry and for your flow domain, and then be able to run your simulation to um, analyze different parameters such as pressure gradient, velocity, um, pressure, I already said pressure, shear stress. This here is the um, cerebral aneurysm. Just a quick visualization. This shows the wall shear stress. So we will be discussing this in a little bit, and then you can post process. That's next. Great. Okay. Yeah, just click it. Just I'll click it. That's that's the wall shear. Oh, <laughs> I wonder if there's like a mute. You can. Yep, so this is just showing um, increase in wall shears. This is the aneurysm here. This is a cerebral aneurysm. And as it flows through the aneurysm, you can see that the wall shear stress around this opening increases. An aneurysm is that like ballooning area, which is abnormal for a vessel. It kind of, yeah, forms as a balloon in the weak areas. It basically expands. Looks like a sack. Looks yeah. Like a <laughs> yep, and it can happen due to essentially rupture of the vessel wall. Yeah. Okay. So moving on to the construction of the uh, fluid flow model. Um, as mentioned before, the fluid was modeled as thixotropic or shear thinning, viscoelastic or incorporating. Uh, viscous and elastic effects, and viscoplastic, which is incorporating uh, time-dependent inel inelasticity. Um, additionally, as also mentioned before, the flow was modeled as Wilmersley or pulsatile, and um, it was also assumed to be using large rigid tubes, uh, which 
would pretty much mitigate the uh, local effects of red blood cell migration, essentially. Um, so in terms of the uh, governing equations, we primarily use the momentum balance, uh, which you can kind of recognize from class uh, following Reynolds transport theorem. Here the uh, total stress tensor you may also recognize uh, can be broken down into isotropic pressure and the remaining stress tensor here, tau. Um, now this tau is what incorporates uh, these properties that you see here in this first bullet point uh, using this giant equation. Um, things of note here is this uh, tau with this funny notation. Uh, it's, it's, it's essentially the upper convected time derivative of tau, um, which is essentially ra the rate of change of tau of a small parcel of fluid in the coordinate system that also deforms with the fluid. Um, and additional parameters are uh, yield stress of the blood, which kind of incorporate the exotropy, uh, bulk module of, el of elasticity, which incorporates viscoelasticity, and uh, the total rate of deformation tensor, which you may also recognize, only contains a symmetric component. Um, and then this plastic viscosity term, which is a function of um, the structure of blood, and that essentially incorporates viscoplasticity. Uh, just to quickly go over the 3D models and parameters, so uh, there were two 3D models that were tested, um, one with the vessel curved, as you see here, and then one with the uh, parent vessel straight. Uh, the following parameters here were used, um, and then these remaining parameters as well, which were uh, measured from uh, fitted uh, real logical analysis. Okay, so now moving on to the boundary condition and property, the primary one that is still yet to be mentioned was uh, how to incorporate Wilmer's sleeve flow, which was done using uh, this sinusoidal pulse, uh, it's essentially a sine wave, where uh, the wave frequency uh, here, there were two wave frequencies that were assessed, one for a normal uh, heart rate and one for tachycardia or elevated heart rate. Um, we also there are also three different uh, flow rate amplitudes that were assessed, um, which in turn give rise to a low, medium, and high values of uh, these three dimensionless quantities, which you may also recognize, especially Reynolds number. Um, so in terms of the initial conditions to actually start the simulation. Uh, the stress field and the velocity field were first uh, assumed to be zero, uh, while the structural parameters assumed to be one. Um, and then there were three periodic cycles that were run. And in order to start calculating the velocities, the, uh, the shear stresses uh, before the data was recorded. So moving on to the results, there are so many different analysis and um, investigation that's given in this study, so I'll just have to highlight a few things for each figure. And as Anikit has mentioned, the study looks into the flow characteristics and the aneurysm with different parameters such as velocity, wall shear stress, tau total, total stress, and the um, lambda, which is, which is basically like the blood structure and also um, by different frequency, different flow rate, and whether the vessel is curved or not. So first, moving into the particle tracking. So um, they test two different frequencies, one hertz and two hertz. And as you can see, for one hertz, there's a recirculation region at the inner side of the aneurysm sac, while for the higher frequency, which probably induced higher flow, has no recirculation region as the more fluid enters through the mouth of the aneurysm, which is right here. Then looking into the velocity, as we have noticed from the previous particle tracking, there is relatively low velocity in the aneurysm sac. And you can also see in the parent artery um, for a um, one hertz, there is a uniform flow. And also as the phase changes for two hertz, there is multi layers of velocities as the inertial force kind of pushes the flow backwards as the um, flow is switched from upstream to downstream this way to downstream to upstream. And this bidirectional flow is further um, shown in this figure, especially at pi, due to the inertial forces. And all in all, there was a higher velocity in the um, 2 hertz, which is kind of um, intuitional. 
And no, next, looking into wall shear stress, there was um, wall shear stress, high wall shear stress near the mouth in the aneurysm, and that's mainly because as the flow split, there is a development in, and the fluid hits the, um, impinges on the aneurysm wall there, in it induces a high wall shear stress. And this could initial, um, this could eventually lead to increase in the mouth, mouth um, length, and also the aneurysm volume, which could be critical for the patients. And also looking at the stress, um, you can see that the dominant tau is in the xx direction, which is the x direction, meaning that the blood um, cells are most likely to be stretched in the x direction. And also there is a similar phenomenon as there is a high tau near the mouth. And also there is lower tau in the sac as there is more stationary flow in the aneurysm sac. And now looking at Okay, so I'll, I'll go quickly. So lam lambda is the blood structure, so meaning that la when lambda is equals one, it's fully structured, while lambda is equals zero, it's all disintegrated. So higher the lambda, and more likely for thrombosis. And as you can see, the lambda is higher in the aneurysm sac, meaning there is that there is um less flow, but at the at the same time, there's only low oscillation, and they claim that 0 0.36 lambda value, they um they're still disintegrated and that's not enough to form the thrombos thrombosis, so there is no time for the blood to recover its structure during the low stress periods. And also, um, this is something similar at because the uh, fl fresh blood continuously enters the aneurysm, it has high disintegration rates, so they're basically concluding that um, under uh, normal uh, hemodynamics conditions, it is not likely to form thrombosis volume in the aneurysm sac. Uh, it's something similar, and they they also compare um, difference between the curved and the uh, straight vessel, and there was no dif significant difference in the particle time between the two vessels, but there was definitely increase in the wall shear stress for the aneurysm wall for the curved vessels, and also they say that um, these waves are derived from low Reynolds number, and these waves are shown in high Re Reynolds number normally but this curved vessel induced this instability. So um, there's there technically there wasn't that big of a difference between the um, TVP and the Newtonian flow, meaning that viscoelasticity didn't make that big of a difference in the hemodynamics. So to conclude, there was a, um, the higher pulse amplitude induced uh, lower structure giving the blood to be uh, softer and, and also um, and the curved vessels induced higher total stress magnitude and destabilized flow and blood structure in the curved vessels. And norm for normal flow, there shouldn't be a thrombus forming in the sac, but with a slower flow or higher stagnation area in the aneurysm sac, there could be thrombus formation and that could eventually lead to aneurysm ruptures. And all in all, this model was accurately able to predict the hemodynamics and the blood behaviors as they took into viscoelasticity and different parameters from the blood into the aneurysm model. And with that ends our presentation and we're open to any questions. Any questions? What's thrombus or thrombosis? Oh, thrombosis is oh, yeah. thrombosis is essentially just a formation of blood clots. So that can happen when you know blood stagnates and pools in one place. It just kind of collects together and hardens. Okay. Uh, to add on to that, um, there I if there's a high shear stress, it could activate the platelets, the blood cells, which in um, in turn makes them form a structure into clots. So higher sh shear stress induces. Um, blood clotting or thrombosis. Yep. So what's your boundary um, condition for your governing equations again? Was it the sinusoidal wave? Yes. Oh, nice. sorry. Yeah, this one. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a, it was essentially the sinusoidal uh, pulse that you see here. Um, so that incorporates the flow rate for, you know, the actual blood flow, uh, but also the sinusoidal component to incorporate um, the pulsatility, so the, you know, I guess the kind of the forward and backward pressure uh, gradient. So, yeah, it was essentially that. Um, in the model, you use, uh, well, they used uh, six, six millimeter diameter. 
Yes. Right. Um, so, so what part of the that is what blood vessel is this? Yes. Yeah, so that's that's this um, the parent blood vessel. Oh, where's the mouse? Oh, I think he's asking which part of the yeah, blood like, 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 what, like, is this more associated with the brain I think or cerebral. like in cerebral, the water? cerebral, cerebral, yeah, yeah. Do they measure different diameters and see if this changes with smaller or bigger diameters? Yeah, so that's one thing that uh, we were also kind of hoping that they did, but I think they only uh, looked at the singular diameter, they only looked at the specific one, and then the resulting uh, radius of curvature for the curved vessel and the annual aneurysm sac height. So this was pretty much constant. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> the non-Newtonian nature of blood, um, maybe ex how does that influence the results? Like what, what do you see, what do you think is, appears here because of that non-Newtonian uh, feature and well, like what if it, w it were not Newtonian, why would it not be there? Well, um, since it experiences this sheer thinning, um, I believe that the viscosity is decreased and the flow rate might also increase, which would actually allow it to flow a little bit better through this aneurysm and be able to um, recirculate better. Oh, that's this lambda. The, the <coughs> lambda is the yes, the structural parameter of it, which is based off of like the formation of these rouleaux. And the rouleau, which is like the clumping of the red blood cells, which makes it more viscous. So, what does lambda approaching one look like? Like it's thrombosed, basically. Yeah, yeah. more thrombosed. More clumped together. How Decrease the, in flow. How does the CFD calculate that? Although that was altered, that was pretty much altered as an input condition. Oh, it's not a function of flow. Uh, well, it's. It was a so, changing scalar parameter. Yeah. Yeah. For this, the, the viscosity is a is a function of uh, this lambda. Yeah, yeah, that's what we have thought of. Yeah. Does the simulation actually have particles in it for blood cells? No, no, right? It's just continuum, is it? Yeah, for the most part, it's like essentially transient uh, continuous simulation. Then how does it know what lambda is? Like, as it does have some kind of equation for lambda somewhere, based on the. <laughs> yeah, complex. Okay. I think they take into different parameters of the blood cell and try to um, apply that to the particle. Yeah, like the most we gathered was that this was kind of based off of some of the experimental results and in the rheological fitting mm -hmm. that was performed as well. So some of those parameters do kind of play into lambda, but they didn't really provide specific details. Is one of you in a blood lab? Well, there is us. <laughs> at the cardiovascular fluid <laughs> mechanics lab. Who's lab? Cardiovascular fluid mechanics lab Dr. under Dr. Nassi. Oh, okay, okay. All right, that's good. I, I was going to say this is a pretty ambitious paper, um, but you did. A, uh, it's good for the class to see like what a real research paper is. It's yeah, like. We collect all the results that we picked, and it's interesting. Any other questions? I think we're good. All right. Thank you. I say for the future groups, the, for the th presentation of the three, the, the presentations get long, but you don't have to cover every single result in the paper. Maybe just cover a few that you find interesting, because the audience's brain pretty much gets full, like, like very, very fast. Good. All right. Who's next? If someone left their phone. Who's next week? Oh, they can do Tuesday. Your Wednesday? <laughs> and no one's Monday? Okay, so you, you're just going to go Wednesday. Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay, so we've got an hour. Um, uh, okay, so I got, this is going to be like a cooking show. Um, all right. This de when you see the video of the um, of the Sumanagashi I showed you last time, I think it's kind of cool. But when you actually do it yourself and you see how you can change things yourself, it's it's pretty. I think it's it's memorable. Um, 
So I thought it was worth the time for me to like get all this stuff from my house, put in here, bike from my previous class, bike across campus with all this stuff to do it. All right, so does everyone have one styrofoam tray? If you don't, um, please, uh, can you just pass this back for them? All right, so we have a couple. And uh, I pass around some paint brushes. And there's more Q-tips, if people want more Q-tips. There's six different colors. Um, what we have is India ink. I think I'll have to demo what we do in the front. Um, and then we're going to figure out a way to pass all this out. Um, all right. And I have, uh, does everyone have paper? There's paper going its way around. You can basically, this is how you're going to save in the old school way, like not digitally but analog, save your results because this paper, this is a special, so this is, um, we're going to use plain water, but this is Bombay India ink. Well, after surging through many different kinds of inks, this is the shows up best on the surface of water. But at the end, we're going to basically put this on top. Don't move it around because it needs. There's a time scale of the absorption due to Darcy's law. There's a thickness here that the, there's little pores that are going to soak up your little artwork. And then after you're done, unfortunately, I only brought one towel, um, but you're going to just kind of put it to the side or hang it on your chair, and then it'll dry and the floor is going to get dirty. We'll just deal with it. But I. Uh, I have some more paper here, but in, um, it needs to be this kind of paper. I don't think it's going to work with, um, and I have a couple, I have a whole other thing. Uh, I have this thing, too. We can pass this around. Some of your trays are too big, so you need to chop it in half, but I'll, if you want more paper. Um, let me just grab this sheet and demo it. All right. OK, so let me just demo what we're going to do. Or we could do it all. Which one of these is water? Well, this is water. OK, thanks. Should we do it all together? Let's do it all together, maybe. What we're going to do is we need to pour uh, enough water to cover the bottom of the tray. Um, please don't overfill it, because you know once you use this once, you kind of have to throw the water away. And I, this is the biggest thing I could bike with to put all the water from the class. <laughs> now I see it's kind of an underestimate. But uh, we'll probably have to go to the water fountain twice to dump it. Oh, we could also put it in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, we're going to put our wastewater in here. You want to put as much water. And you can pour the water now in the tray if you want. You basically want to cover the bottom of the tray. Um, why don't everyone do that? Here. There you, go. Uh, you don't have a tray. Did I take your tray? Where's the extra trays? Can you pass it back up? Oh, here's the one here. There you go. Okay. So pour water into your tray. Just need a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah, just enough to cover the bottom. Okay. Did you get enough water? Um, I'll just I'll, I'll get it when you guys are. I'll just probably go around and let you guys do it. You see, there's a, the tray is kind of hydrophobic, so um, you have to put enough so gravity can overcome that stuff. There, those new ones are really. Uh, just borrow some of Layla's water. Should be nice. So these new trays, I bought those online. Now I realize those are too hydrophobic. So that will work well for my stuff. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Now we're gonna have the ink, um, and we have these trays. We have six different colors of ink. Um, Maybe the easiest thing is everyone take a tray, and I'll go around, and, um, and I'll put one ink in each of your things. Or what's the smartest? Or maybe let's, let's pass the ink around um, in bottles of three. And then this one I'll pass around the back. So take a couple. Uh, you can share the tray between you and your partner. That's probably easiest, okay. and we don't have to dump. So maybe share a tray between you and the person next to you. I have some extra trays. Yeah, you guys are probably gonna have to sit closer together to share a tray. Do you still have any more paper? Yeah, yeah, I do. There's a bunch here. Um, I'll just pass around the Q-tips. Oh. 
Whoever needs more Q-tips, uh, could you pass this? Raise your hand if you need more Q-tips. Go ahead. Grab it. And you don't need very much ink, because basically just a single drop is going to be enough to do stuff. Um, so they're going to pass the ink this way. And I'm going to put this in the last row. I'm going to pass it forward. So just a few, a few drops in each, because basically you're going to use part of a drop. Here, you guys take some and then put it in the next row. Do you have another thing? I'll just take the Q-tips are equivalent. Oh, OK, OK. Into the tray, um, how many colors you want? Just a few drops, because you just need like the smallest part of a drop. In, in the ink tray. Yeah. And you're going to share this with your friend. Yeah. Where's Saint? OK, then, um, okay, then you're going to have your own. That's fine. Okay, and when you're done, you can just take some ink and just put a little bit of ink in the center in the center of the tray, and then uh, you can blow. And you can try different colors. What works best is contrast. If you have like a little bit of a little bit of different colors, like how they did in the video. All right, you guys got the ink. Do you guys want some ink? Oh, And when you're ready, you can just take some of the Q-tube and uh, and put, try to put some different colors. Less ink, a little less ink is better. Yeah, this is good. I should have Ethan focus this on Ethan stuff. If you want other effects, you can blow it, or you can wave something around with it. Oh. Try a different color. Uh, and you don't want to mix colors, so that's what the Q-tip is for. So what you're seeing there is the fluid goes outward, because you're reducing the surface tension in the center. Um, the higher surface tension in the surrounding uh, pushes it forward. Some colors show up better. The darker, you could try some dark colors. Whoa, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm looking with the blue. I think that's great. There's blue, you start there's blue, blue right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there's yeah. Blue. I'm waiting for the blue to show over there. And grab some. That looks great. Need some Q-tips here. Yeah. Uh, that's how we're going to absorb the ink into the paper. The paper is slightly porous. Um, so this, all the ink you're seeing is actually all on the water surface. This is a special type of like low density or slightly hydrophobic ink. Oh, Don, that looks great. Um, low density ink. That sits on the sits on the water surface. Yeah, that turns out really well. I think the first drop is really light for some reason, but once you add more, and it, you notice it's always radially symmetric because your Q-tip is pretty much um, releasing it equally in all directions. So people blow it. I'd be allowed to sit there for a little bit to absorb it. Yeah, yeah. And when you're, if you want to start again, we have plenty of paper, and this will be the waste bin.
So people used to dye clothing like this. You'd put like a scarf or some kind of blouse. And we have plenty of Q-tips. You got the other colors too, right? And use a Q-tip for a different color if you need. Yeah. So I have a. We realized we're going to sit here like this for a while. I have this towel. I have one towel. Uh, yeah, that's probably a good idea. But right now you can put it on here. It takes a while to it'll take a while to dry. Yeah, we need. Um, we try to, it doesn't work with regular paint. There's something special about this ink that allows it to uh, uh, be like a surfactant. Like um, instead of the water. Oh. Um, possibly, but then you have to change the ink too, because this ink is like a, is water, probably somewhat water based. It's just, it's called India ink, but we. Um, Basically, this, I, uh, I worked with this artist um, to build this activity. It took us a couple weeks to figure out the right combination of stuff. So if someone's done, Ethan's going to go get paper towels for the whole class. He probably could use some help, because uh, otherwise you have to stand there <laughs> and like hold, it, hold, it, hold the thing. You could put it on a tray if you want, but we really need something absorbent in the end, because it'll help, help it dry. That looks really good. I'm gonna look, look at this. This is how this turned out. The light colored paper actually works out pretty well. Look at the, this. Is a, this is what the final product looks like. Um, how long should it sit? Mm, Ethan, how long do you, how long do you, how long do you put your scent, Daniel? Uh, it's like a minute or two. A minute or two. And if you want to start over, you might have to like pour it out, or maybe you could still use the same water. I'm not sure. Well, I don't understand. Why doesn't the water just get saturated? I think that this ink somehow, so when it's spreading out, it's spreading out to a single monolayer. Uh, ben Franklin did a very similar experiment. He took like some oil and put it on the top of a lake, and he measured that it spread out for like you know ten square meters, and he used that to calculate how many molecules are in that in that amount of oil that he had. How's this work? Do you think it's getting the table? I guess it's pretty good. It's absorb. It's pretty pretty absorbent. It looks like it's fine. Oh, that looks really good. Yeah, the yellow. Uh, paper towel. Um, so this should be face up, right? Probably, so it doesn't get absorbed. Probably. Probably. Paper towels are at the end of the rows. Please pass them down. There's a few more here. I think we have enough. One paper towel seems to be absorbent enough to deal with it. 
Yeah, you can go take one. Do you guys have paid house? Yeah. Here's some paper towels. And there's more paper if people want to do it again. Thanks. Yep. Thanks. I don't know if you want to put the paper towel on top of your computer, though, maybe next to it. There's two there. You got a paper towel? Yeah, we have a few. Okay. Paper towel? Yes. Need more paper? Need more paper done? Oh no, I just you want to dump? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was good. Maybe it might be if that is which is the ink side? The other That's side? The yeah, maybe the ink side should go up. Because oh. I see stuff like putting those orbs. But yeah, it really got all the high resolution. Yeah. There's a vortex stretching and stuff. Oh, okay, it might show better once it dries. You never know. Okay. Yeah, I have a niece that is going to love this. Are you going to try to do it with her? Oh, yeah. yeah. More paper towels? More paper towels? Um, Ethan only got what he could carry. If you want need more, you're going to have to go to the bathroom and grab some. Yeah, go ahead and grab some. And thanks, Cedric, for taking leadership on the wastewater. We can wait till everyone's done, then we can totally dump the wastewater. Okay, yeah, that's good. Um, yeah. You're done too? Okay. It's okay, it'll, it'll dry. But yeah, the only thing you really need for this is the, um, oh, I should take a little, for the people that, the online people. So did they use this clock? I'm sure it's some special type of, uh, I think I saw it doing s with silk and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, not only they use, I'm not sure if they use India ink, because I think if you wash those clothes, it would be, it would get ruined. All right, the used implements can go here. Um, let's just pass this around. Be careful, it's pretty inky. 
And if you have any paper that you don't want to use, uh, you can put it back. You can use it for next year. Yeah, Q-tips, but we'll put them in there for now, and so we'll just dump it. The, you don't want to dump the, the paintbrush we keep. The Q-tips are just as good as the paintbrush, right? I like I them better. Oh, really? Maybe I'll just bring the Q-tips next time. I guess that's what we did last time because there's a bunch of dried paint. Okay. Yeah, I don't think we have time to all wash them all out. It'll be fine. Oh, you're still using this one, right? Yeah. Okay. You're not. You're not going to use it. I think I use it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. You already made it. Vortices. Vortices look really good. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. We could dump the used paint in here. Oh, absorb this one. Yeah. After all the waste. You mean, yeah, someone can take charge of that. <laughs> but I think it's just going to be brown because it's going to be all mixed. <laughs> let's stack them. When they're empty, let's stack them. They weren't rinsed out before. I think once it gets dried, it really doesn't make a difference. You're not used? Okay. So let's stack the trays. <laughs> There's a bin going on for the, of the used Q-tips and the um, and the paintbrushes. <laughs> yeah, as it, when the ink dries, I think it doesn't really matter because it's mostly it's mostly just. Once it dry, I think I never wash it. That's why the trays are dirty. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. We are going to go back to normal schedule in a few minutes. Oh yeah, if there's if you have some paper towels, let's try to like keep it somewhat clean. Nine So you can let it dry till the end of class on the towel. Um, ideally, I think I could have we had like a little fan here, but maybe by the end of class it'll get dry enough to carry around. All right. Uh, let's see. No, 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 dark cam. Um, so let's stack the trays. Any extra Q-tips, let's just toss them. I don't even want to put clean, dirty Q-tips with the, the dirty towels. Um, there's a bin. See that plastic bin? That's, yeah, we're going to put the dirty stuff in there. Yeah. And let's stack the ink trays here.
you can just put everything in there, and then we'll just um, we'll just toss them. Because I got to toss the, those Q-tips will be is tra our trash. All right, let's uh, get back to class, and uh, we can do a little cleanup at the very end too. So the trays get back over are over here. Um, yeah, classic trays in that that pile. Yeah, dr pretty dry is fine, fine enough. They were not clean for you to, when you started. Okay. Okay, so I've posted the um, <coughs> posted the new homework. Um, we are basically going to start actually solving Navier-Stokes equations. Um, the last lecture we talked about vor vor this. Uh, idea of strain of vorticity. Um, uh, sometimes you have to calculate vorticity. Um, uh, you definitely need to calculate strain rate of strain matrix because some of these problems you have to calculate the uh, dissipation. So this is the next homework. Um, the first one is uh, basically you have this oscillating sphere on the water surface and um, you want to figure out how this system is governed by dimensionless parameters rather than by by variables. So you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, at least nine variables. And then uh, you can apply Buckingham's, pi the Buckingham's theorem based on the dimensions to figure out how many dimensionless groups and what they are. The second part is what we're going to do today. We're going to show you how dimensionless groups arise, not just from um, the dimensions, but also from the governing equations. Number two is uh, basically imagine I have like an infinitely long can of Coke and I'm swirling it. Um, and at t equals 0, I stop swirling. Um, that's basically different from how you did undergrad fluids. Undergrad fluids was always steady state problems. We're going to do the first small adjustment from steady state by looking at um, change from a steady state, like kind of like quiescence. That's what it's called when fluid gets quieter and quieter. Um, so you can imagine, you know, information from the boundary travels inward, but it takes time for that to happen. Um, and the last problem is kind of like a Cartesian version of the top problem. The middle problem was like a you know a can of coke swirling. The bottom problem, we have basically um, the fluid being being quiescent, and then suddenly we move it at a constant force per unit area tau. So a constant um, shear stress. Um, it'll be a modification of Rayleigh's first problem, which we're going to do not this time, but probably in the next week or two. Um, where, that, where there's various uh, boundary conditions you use. A constant, uh, basically a change in velocity, a change in stress, and this one's a change in stress. Okay. So that's the homework. Uh, I already posted it on Canvas. You can download it. It's not super easy to transition after you just did art. Because <laughs> you're so relaxed. It's like everyone's, all the blood flows on that side of the brain. <laughs> But uh, I did want to make sure we had time for the activity. I considered doing the end of class, but then if, I, if you want to do art rushed, you might as well just not do it. So, all right. Um, so let's see, a couple things. So quiz. First of all, quiz one is posted. The solutions online. Um, posted. Posted. Um, quiz. Sorry, not quiz. Um, homework three is posted. It'll be due in two weeks. Um, we might add, add some time if I don't get through enough material. But I think you can definitely do the first problem starting this weekend. Um, homework two is due Friday. Um, if you're listening in the queue section, I'm sorry you couldn't participate in the demo. Um, but uh, I can put a list of the materials. And I think you guys have the queue section you have until Monday. All right. So as you saw from the homework, the first question is figuring out the dimensionless groups um, from the governing equations. That's one way that the, that's another way the governing equations are important. Um, have people done that before? Non-dimensionalized governing equations? What class was that? Fluids. Undergrad fluids? Yeah. Where'd you take that? Texas Tech. Oh, okay. Anyone else do it yet? I saw a little bit of it, but I wanna 
Guy in Pomona. Oh, okay. It's an yeah. online course that I looked at. Yeah. Good. Well, we basically, once you define the variables, it's quite, it just, you need to do it once, and then after that, you'll kind of understand where these units come from. Um, I would say the only addition that most of you probably haven't done is we, you also non dimensionalize the boundary conditions, um, and that can lead to dimensionless groups involving service tension. What's the purpose? Okay, so Cedric asks, why do we even bother non dimensionalizing it? Especially since you didn't learn it as undergrad, um, it is. People do it because it'll make your algebra easier, um, because you don't carry around a bunch of units, and also, generally in JFM and other kind of fluid papers, they generally plot dimensionless units, so they don't have to say, "Hey, this is like meters per second or like whatever." They just say, "This is a dimensionless unit." So it's. It's, uh, it's in, uh, in this field of engineering, it's very, very common because it makes graphs easier to do um, and also helps you get rid of certain groups right away. If you know, like, for example, Reynolds number high, then you don't have to deal with a certain group. Um, so it gives you insight into which groups are important and allows you to graph stuff better. Um, All right. There are two ways that you could have, I mean, there are many ways you could have flow characterized by a single speed and a single length scale. One is if you have a channel flow. Um, and then, you know, as you know from undergrad fluids, you're going to get something that looks like this. So you get uh, some character velocity u. The other one is if you have some particle um, moving at some velocity u. So, for example, each of these. Like the presentation we just saw on the aneurysms, that'd be the blood vessel radius, and the other one would be the blood cell size. Both of these will have different Reynolds numbers, so it'll tell you which forces are important. Um, so once you've defined a length and a velocity scale, you can you can get rid of s velocity, uh, length, and time in your um, in your uh, governing equations. And how big something is is generally one of the most important parts of, of the physics of the problem. This, uh, I didn't even say if it's a, you could imagine it's a radius, it could be a square channel, or it could be infinitely long channel. There's lots of possibilities. But, uh, and for th the homework, you're basically going to do things that are infinitely long into the page. All right. So basically, the big idea we're going to call that's supposed to be a star, an asterisk. We're going to call the star variables dimensionless. So they're going to go between 0 and 1. Um, uh, okay. Mm. All right. So when I use the, I'm going to, I guess I could call these u. So I'll call these, because we've got to distinguish the uh, non dimensionless ones from the dimensionless ones. So we'll call these uh, v. Um, so, you know, V has some units, meters per second, and if I divide, you know, my velocity uh, vector by meters per second, you're going to get a dimensionless velocity vector. Similarly, X star will be the position vector X divided by my length scale. So, for example, the blood vessel presentation, the, you know, your position is going to be determined in terms of radii of the vessel. Like, how many radii down are we on the tube? T star will be T over L. So once you defined a length scale and a velocity scale, you define the time scale for the problem, which we'll call L over V. All right. Now once you define how big the problem is and how fast it's moving, um, that's as far as you can go. The rest, you have to go with basically whether the flow is what's called Reynolds, high Reynolds number or low Reynolds number. So right now we're not going to define a pressure. We're going to let the, the 
non-dimensionalization process to tell us what this pressure pi is going to be. And it makes sense. Pressure is a, t a force, whereas length and time, they're kinematics. So maybe I'll even, these are kinematics, kinematic variables. And this, is, this deals with force. So we need to wait a little longer to see how the governing equations tells us what that, f that uh, pressure should be. And so that's P over pi. pi. So pi is an unspecified characteristic pressure. I'm going to use this word characteristic a lot. Um, characteristic is like kind of like the 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 ballpark value for what the pressure should be. Like it should be the same order of magnitude of the other pressures in the system. Just like L is like the ballpark value of how big your blood cell is. Um, you know, the blood cell is like it has like two dimensions, and you could measure really closely, but it's basically to one significant digit how big it's going to be. Okay. So because of those, we also have this idea that. Um, so d by dx is also is going to be d by dx star is going to be um, l d by dx. All right. Why is that? Okay, if I were to do it really carefully, it's like this. It'd be, except this would be one over l, and you'd write you write that as d by dx. Okay. And, uh, but we're not going to use that symbol because this is a grad school. We're going to use the NABLA. All right, so that's the der uh, derivative in all three directions. Okay, so the game is that you've been dealing with the dimensional variables, and we're going to convert the entire equations in dimensionless form. All right, so let's do that. So let's plug them into our momentum equations. Um, I almost want to do this as like a class activity. So um, here, let's just do this one first, and then we'll and then I'll sh uh, we'll do the whole thing. So uh, basically, non-dimensionalize this for me at your seats, and then we're going to do the whole Navi Stokes. But I want to make sure you can do this one first. So basically, what you want to do is, for every variable, um, substitute the uh, the new one. So for example, u, you'll be d of uh, u star, right? And t, I'm going to do um, t star l v over l. So I'm going to get v squared over l times du star dt star. So everyone see what I did? I just substitute for u, and I basically all these top things are are basically what u and t are equal to, and then I replace those with the starred variables. Let's stop for like ten seconds, to make sure everyone can do that. And if you're done with that, then uh, let's do the whole Navi Stokes. I'm going to write it for you, and you're going to do the whole equation. So once you've done it with that one, see if you can do it, go with every term. And then we'll compare answers. And if you have a question, raise your hand. I'll come and help you with that first term. Yeah. Uh, oh. um, didn't u was used over v? Yeah, v is the characteristic velocity of the flow. It's like how big the channel is, how fast the channel is moving, or how big your how fast your particle is moving. V is like just a number. It's given. It's not a variable. Okay. Yeah, that's a big difference between u and v. What are we supposed to do here in this 
do you understand how to do this one? Where basically, so this is in terms of dimensional variables. We want to write this whole thing dimensionless. Oh, so and when you do that, you're going to get dimensional, dimensionless numbers popping out. Okay. Um, everyone needs to do this at least once in their life. So we're just going to do it together. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I mess, I probably messed it up. Let me go check. Yeah, I messed up because it needs to be v squared in the front. All right. All right, let's do this carefully. So t is equal to um, v t star over l. And this will be v. Uh, T star, T minus T star. Let me do all of them carefully. U is equal to V U star. That's right. No, there's L over V. This is L over V. Okay. Thanks. So we're going to use these. Your final equation is just have star variables and a and a bunch of units in the front. You only don't non dimensionalize the variables. So okay. you leave the densities there, and so whatever is in there is going to be pulled out to the front. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm, I don't know. But are we only, uh, we're only doing Navi Stokes. I don't know what the acoustics people do. They probably have something special. But yeah, they probably have non dimensional. They have a baseline density. Oh, you're done. Yeah, bring it to the bring it to the outside. Yeah. Bring those to the outside. And uh, all right, I see we're pretty much getting close to the finish line. So all right. So if you collect the terms on the outside of your parentheses, you should get this. Remember, you got to non-dimensionalize the derivatives too, because de taking a derivative is is dividing by a length scale. All right. So if you collect things together. You know, the time derivative term and the um, convective derivative, those actually have the same units. Um, 
one has one velocity and one time, and one has two velocities and one length, and those give you the same units here. Um, all right, so let's. So, why do we do all that work to basically write a bunch of stars? Well, now you have basically these terms in the front of each equation, each each expression here, and the magnitude of those will determine basically if those get kept or not. So let's go over three different cases: um, high Reynolds number, low Reynolds number, and oscillation. So let's say the inertial terms are greater than the viscous terms. Uh, the inertial terms are uh, the stuff on the left side, and the uh, viscous term is the one with the viscosity on the right. All right. So because I said inertial is going to be dominant, um, I chose a characteristic pressure that's consistent with that. Um, and that is this dynamic pressure, um, something that scales with the density, which is how much inertia changes. Um, if inertia is greater than uh, viscous terms, um, and I choose pi equals this, I can basically simplify this a little more into the following. So I haven't taken any terms out yet. I'm just going to do a, um, a division. I think this might be the first time we're talking about Reynolds number in this class. This is the most important dimensionless group. All right. So once I've defined my pressure, characteristic of pressure, it allows me to basically, you know, this entire equation is dimensionless, and that last term goes as 1 over Reynolds number. So as particles get bigger and bigger, our flows get faster and faster, um, the e Euler equation is what's relevant. I'm going to start dropping the stars. This is getting annoying. OK, and th unfortunately, this is what um, a lot of fluid mechanics papers do. They start dropping um, uh, the stars. And you just assume what you're seeing is dimensionless. Um, oh, yeah, that's way better. OK, these are, these are the Euler equations. We will get back to these in a later problem set um, when we do complex potentials. Euler equations describes um, ideal or inviscous flows. There's whole textbooks on Euler's equations, um, particularly for aerodynamics, because they can actually get a lot of the flow field um, from Ignoring viscosity. But there's some physics that changes because you've dropped the highest derivative term. I would say the three problems of the homework are not of this type. Um, they are of the type that we keep viscosity. So that's case two.
Yeah. Knows your dropped. You you have. I'll, I'll stop doing the. Um, you oh. have dropped. You have dropped the highest derivative term. Um, you know, originally you had the um, del squared u, the Laplacian of u, and that's gone. So solutions tend to look more like potential type flows. They don't tend to look like um, plus a type plus a and like a other type like the low Reynolds number flows. There's yeah, there's a whole. I think someone's going to do a course, a journal club on. So who's doing the journal club on low Reynolds number on? Uh, on someone's isn't someone doing something on um, Purcell's paper? Oh no, maybe you guys changed it. But Purcell has a great paper called Life at Low Reynolds Number um, that talks about time reversibility. Basically, there are certain things that don't work. Um, I'll, let's like, write the low Reynolds Number equation, and we'll talk about it briefly. So if this is greater, much greater than inertial terms, um, we choose um, the characteristic of pressure to be what's important at the inertial limit, which is <laughs> rho nu u, and we'll put a 2 over there. Um, And note, in basically, in all these fluid flow problems, you have to keep pressure. Um, pressure is what drives flow. Um, uh, if you have no pressure in your equations, they're kind of like not physical anymore because um, uh, there's no. It just all becomes kinematics. So pressure is really important to keep. So that's why we're careful about trying to keep it. Um, okay. So in the viscous limit. I'm again just going to write them without the stars. All right. Limit. Oh, sorry. It's, it's ten. Uh, let me just write this one last equation. Um, low runs over. Zero is equal to negative del p um, plus del squared u, and zero is equal to del dot u. We have the Stokes equations. So um, there's a lot of weird things that happen in the Stokes equations. You notice there's no time dependence anymore. Um, I'll, a lot of people mentioned in course projects. I mean, you've probably seen that demo. I had a version. You, you basically, you know, you put die and you rotate a cylinder, and the die will get dispersed, and you rotate it back, and you get exactly what you had before. Basically, if you do basically the same motion back again, you will get to where you started with. Um, that's why you don't see any microscopic fish. You know, fish are only high Reynolds number. Once you get to something that low Reynolds number, you have to have corkscrews. So you have to have a device that basically breaks symmetry. That that if you you know a problem with a fish, a tail going waving oscillating, it looks the same forward and backward. Like the movie, if I play it forward backward, it looks the same. So a fish would basically go forward and go backward, go forward and go backward every time it flipped its tail. So you have to have either something flexible, like a, something that is like an oar um, that that bends um, due to the fluid, or you have to have something that uh, has like a handedness. So that basically, if you spin it one way, it looks different from spinning it the other way. Um, so there's no microscopic fish, and I think people have done that. Um, so I've shown you how to non-dimensionalize. You should be able to do number one on the homework. Um, we'll proceed next time. We've got to non-dimensionalize the boundary conditions, um, at least part, part number one. We'll show you how the fruit number uh, arises from the boundary conditions. And then we'll start heading towards uh, actually solving Navier-Stokes. There are only three problems in this homework, but I would say this is probably one of your longest homeworks yet um, because there's a lot of steps for each of these three problems. Um, so we'll, we'll go through it in class. Thanks for helping out with the demo. Did you guys enjoy the demo?